So good afternoon. Or as we do in the ed school. It's always so amazing how quickly that works. So good afternoon. Look, the weather is beautiful. It's a wonderful day to celebrate many, many accomplishments. So good afternoon. Much, much better. My name is Bridget Terry Long, and I'm very, very proud to be the Dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I am joined on stage by several of my HGSC colleagues, as well as esteemed speakers, who I will introduce as the ceremony unfolds. Together, it is our pleasure to welcome all of you to this year's convocation ceremony, especially the 649 who will be graduating tomorrow. <laughs> Convocation is an important moment to recognize the many outstanding individuals who have contributed to the HTSE community this year. Today's ceremonies will begin with the presentation of the year's Morningstar Award for Excellence in Teaching, followed <laughs> followed by the presenta presentation of our Intellectual Contribution Awards, Marshall Awards, and the Phyllis Strimling Award. <laughs> oh, you guys are gonna be a great group. We will then hear from our faculty and student speakers, after which we will present the 2023 Alumni Council Awards. Lastly, we will hear from our convocation speaker, Dr. Ruth Simmons. And I have suddenly discovered how many of you went to Smith or Brown. <laughs> After she concludes, I will share a few final announcements with you, and then it's off to the block party. <laughs> yes, and the faculty and staff band. Can't wait. <laughs> but before we get too far along, I'd like to recognize those who came before us and the space we share today. Harvard University is located on the traditional ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. We also acknowledge Harvard's entanglements with slavery and its many legacies, as the university's initiative on Harvard and the legacy of slavery makes clear. Let us recognize the enslaved individuals who helped to build Harvard University and other colleges around the world. Acknowledging our history is an important step in combating the erasure of the important contributions, sacrifices, and stories of those before us. And it is a step towards ensuring a culture of awareness, respect, and accountability within our community. It is now my pleasure to present an important annual award recognizing a member of the faculty for excellence in teaching, excellence in formal and informal advising, and evidence of a caring, respectful, and enthusiastic commitment to students. The Morningstar Family Teaching Award was established in 2000 with a gift from Faith Morningstar, an HGSE alumna, and her husband, the Honorable Richard Morningstar, an alumnus of the college. Faith's experience as a student here inspired her and her family to establish an award that would not only recognize great teaching, but also those faculty members that helped to create a supportive environment in which our students thrive. Faith and her husband Richard and her daughter-in-law Liz are here today. Please join me in thanking them and their family for their steadfast support of teaching at HGSC. The Morning Star recipient is chosen each year based on nominations from HGSE students. The award includes a monetary prize and recognition on a plaque in Longfellow Hall. This year, we had 104 nominations for a total of 37 faculty members. 
This outpouring of praise is a testament to the attention members of the community place on teaching and mentorship. And while this is never an easy decision, one faculty member's nomination stood out. One student wrote, Professor Redding genuinely cares about her students. Beyond teaching us each week, she is a mentor and an advocate for each and every one of us. She has the unique ability to make all her students feel seen and valued in a manner that is authentic. Another student shared, Alexis has a remarkable capacity for creating an environment of genuine welcome and deep care in every setting. It's so natural that it almost feels unconscious on her part, which is what makes it all the more impressive because she has clearly put so much effort into being the incredible instructor she is and creating a safe and thoughtful classroom environment. And finally, I have never learned as much from a college course as I did from H205. The information I retained from Dr. Redding's engaging lectures and evocative in-class exercises I plan to apply throughout the remainder of my career. She has empowered me to envision a future for myself dedicated to creating educational experiences that are, that are as meaningful for the students I will serve and as the experiences she provided me and my HGSE colleagues. And so without further ado, I'm delighted to share that this year's Morningstar Award winner is Alexis Redding. So I was looking for a certificate, but she will receive this certificate and the inscription says, or reads, in recognition of your excellence in teaching and advising and your caring, respectful, and enthusiastic commitment to students. Please join me again in congratulating Alexis. For the past 16 years, HGSC has recognized students from each master's program with an intellectual contribution award. Master's students were given the opportunity to nominate fellow students, the people who most inspired their learning and intellectual inquiry over the course of the year. The list of nominated students were then reviewed by the master's program faculty co-chairs who selected honorees. I'm very pleased to recognize two students from each master's program as the recipients of the 2023 Intellectual Contribution Award. As I read each student's name, they will step forward to receive a certificate and gold honor cord to be worn tomorrow at commencement. The inscription on this certificate reads, and recognition of your academic achievement and your contribution to the academic life of HGSE as nominated by your student peers and the HDSE faculty. So starting with the Education Leadership Organizations and Entrepreneurship Program, Jared Bellot. Good job. We also have Palki Bhattacharya. From the Education Policy and Analysis Program, Doris Ancantera Quiones. and Bruno Villegas McCubbin. <laughs> From the Human Development and Education Program, Amelia Ng. <laughs> and Estella Sato Shiratori.
from the Learning Design, Innovation, and Technology Program, Mar excuse me, Marin Boyne. I'm, I guess I practiced this one. Marin Moy Saha. We also have Donna Antonella Vera Zadivar. From the Teaching and Teacher Leadership Program, Robert Russo. And Molly Dutton Sanderson. Once again, congratulations to all of our Intellectual Contribution Award winners, and thank you so much for enriching the HGSE experience. It is now my pleasure to present the 2023 Commencement Marshals. Commencement Marshals are elected by their peers for their leadership and their involvement in the HGSE community and their commitment to service. They are honored with an exempl as exemplary role models and representatives of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Two Marshals are elected from each of our two doctoral programs. One Marshal is elected from each of the five master's programs. As I read each student's name, they will step forward to receive the Marshal's medallion to be worn tomorrow at commencement. And the Marshal's for the PhD in Education program, Paulina Hadung. And Eileen McGivney. And the marshals for the EDLD program are JJ Munoz and Mecca Smith. And the marshals for the Master of Education are for the Education, Leadership, Organizations, and Entrepreneurship program. Ivy Ryan. <laughs> For the Education Policy and Analysis Program, Rahat Lukwamdi. Lukawala. For the Human Development and Education Program, Inako Iri. <laughs> and for the Teaching and Teacher Leadership Program, Lila Bethel. Congratulations to all of our marshals. Oh, I am so sorry. I apologize. I apologize. Last, but certainly not least, for the Learning Design, Innovation, and Technology Program, Tra Verma. Thank you for the assist. <laughs> and congratulations again to all of our marshals.
It is now my pleasure to present the Phyllis Strimling Award. This award was created in 2000 to honor Phyllis Strimling, an HGSC alumna from the class of 1989 and the former director of the Radcliffe Seminars program. I am so pleased to welcome Phyllis and her family to today's convocation, as well as Holly Weeks, Rob Scalia, and Neil Yanofsky, the three former Radcliffe uh, Seminars fellow excuse me, faculty, who created the award. Please join me in thanking Phyllis, Holly, Rob, and Neil for their support. <laughs> the Phyllis Strimling Award recognizes an HGSE student who works to advance society by advancing women, demonstrates inclusive leadership, and is inspirational to others promotes community as a management approach, and demonstrates the ability to employ multiple perspectives and sound decision making. This year's recipient is Amanda Lee Aiken. just a little bit to say about you. Okay, so Amanda is a candidate in the Doctorate of Education Leadership Program. Prior to her time at HGSC, Amanda was an award-winning principal in New Orleans and served as the Chief External Affairs Officer and Senior Chief Schools Officer for the NOLA Public School during the historic time when schools were returned from state control to local control. At HGSC, Amanda has focused her studies and her work on ensuring more women, and specifically women of color, thrive in leadership roles across the education sector. And as a 2021 Presidential Public Service Fellow, she was able to do just that, launching a fellowship that supports novice leaders of color with New Schools for New Orleans, a nonprofit on a mission to create excellent public schools for every child. Amanda is also a graduate of Spelman College and Teachers College Columbia. Upon graduation from HGSC, Amanda will continue to focus on diversifying school and executive leadership across the education ecosystem. Through her leadership development firm, Ailey Solutions, Amanda will work with a portfolio of nonprofit organizations and foundations that seek to address the dearth of diverse leadership in education. So please join me again in congratulating this year's Phyllis Strimling Award winner, Amanda Lee Aiken. I would now like to introduce our first student speaker, Ebene Green. <laughs> Ebene was chosen by our selection committee of faculty, staff, and students to be one of two student speakers this year. A candidate in the Doctor Doctorate of Education Leadership Program, Ebene has spent time doing two things, evaluating the systemic and cultural shifts required for long-term equitable change, and exploring the possibility of systemic change, grace-filled, human-centered, creative spaces between communities and policymakers. She served as the co-lead of the Black Student Union in 2020 to 2021, and as outreach chair of the 18-year-old Black Policy Conference, she began a partnership between HGSE and the Harvard Kennedy School to create the Next Generation Black Policy Conference an extension geared towards undergraduate and high school age organizers, policymakers, and movement leaders. Ebene is a proud graduate of Stanton College Prep in Jacksonville, Florida, Boston College, and Northwestern University. And immediately after graduation, Ebene will be completing a commitment to 50CAN, a national education policy advocacy organization. So please join me in welcoming Ebene Green.
So I'm gonna have to do this really quickly. Where is cohort 11? Right. So I want you to know that I made it and that I'm on time. And I'd also like to, uh, for my parents, and I want you to know that I always wanted to say this to you and I'm glad I get to say it at Harvard graduation, but we made it. <laughs> And Sugar Mama, you made it, and I'm so happy. <clears throat> so, now that I've said that, I just also need you to know that, y'all, I am so tired. <laughs> like, I am so exhausted. And I know that the concealer under my eyes is concealing, but I need you to know that the circles under my eyes are also circling. So, when I leave here, I'm going to take a nap. But I'm going to put it in context for you. So see, I grew up in the black church. And on Sundays, we would wake up and we would go to Sunday school. And then we'd have brunch. And then we'd have eat afternoon church. And then we'd have lunch. And then we'd go to evening church. But between lunch and evening church, we would take naps. And they were the best naps of my life. And that's the kind of nap that I'm taking when I leave here. So, so I'd like to invite you to join me in this nap. Because if there's anything the world needs us to do as newly mentored Harvard graduates is to get some rest. Because you know what else you get to do when you rest? You get to dream. And so you can't dream if you don't rest. And I'm only here because I have ancestors who chose to dream. If you're like me, your path to the Crimson Hood started well before you even put in an application or before you even heard about HGSE. I'm going to tell you the story where mine started. I'm going to start with my grandparents. See, my grandfather, Blanchard, wanted to go to college. And so he joined World War II so that he could get the GI Bill. And he went all the way to Guam. And he came back home. What they told him in the South was that there was no room for soldiers like him in college. But they sent him to Korea instead. When he came home, he had to organize to vote. And then I'm going to go with my grandmother, Mary. My grandmother, Mary, was a sharecropper who used to pick cotton. She did not get to graduate high school. But she raised five fantastic children. And she bought a house with money that she earned from working in a factory. And it was a beautiful house. But a, convict, a contract lesser tried to steal her house. My grandmother, Mary, who's here, is a brilliant woman. And when that woman tried to steal money from her, she, she wouldn't accept the checks. But my grandmother sent money orders, because money orders have receipts. So when my grandmother showed up at eviction court, she had those receipts, and that woman never saw it coming. I'm also going to go to my birth grandmother, who I never had an opportunity to meet. Her name is Livia. And she came all the way from Latvia. And after World War II, she traveled to a German refugee camp. And then she took her two baby girls, and she got on a ship, and she went all the way over to New York to start a new life for her children. You see, I know that if you dig down deep, that you have stories just like mine. And I really know because I'm super chatty, and I've talked to you about them in front of Gutman. We talked about them at Felipe's. Some of you have talked to me. You don't even know my name, but you've told me these stories. And there is these stories that we love to tell because everyone loves to hear struggle stories, right? But I want to remind us that our families had more than struggle. They had imagination. They had dreams. And that is why we're standing here now. So when I reframe the story about my grandfather Blanchard, I like to remember that he was also a young man going to sleep in Guam, dreaming about graduating with his new wife and going off to Florida a and and then when my grandmother went to sleep in her house, she didn't just go to sleep. She dreamed about going to see her son walk across the stage at Southern University. 
and that when Lydia was falling asleep with her arms wrapped around her little girl, she was dreaming about what their future could look like. And somehow their dreams have turned into their granddaughter standing here giving a commencement speech here at Harvard Graduate School of Education. And I want to remind you it's because they had more than hustle. They had imagination. They had dreams. They believed in freedom, and freedom requires dreaming. I know that your families had the same, but what are you dreaming about? And how do you know if you're always stuck on hustle? My homegirl, Trisha Hersey, the Nat Bishop, who I talk about all the time, says, daydreaming is a form of rest that feels like the opening of your heart to do what it's supposed to do. At any given moment, we can turn on the news and open the newspaper. There are a million and one things that are going right, wrong. But right here, right now, there are 956 people, souls in this building, who were brought here by dreams, who have an opportunity to make things go right. Y'all, we made it. I know we've earned this rest, and the world certainly needs new dreams. We need your dreams. So come on and join me in this nap. Take a rest with me, dream with me, and let's go change the world. So thank you, Ebene, and congratulations. It is my pleasure to present you as a 2023 Student Speaker Award this honor. Okay. All right. Give me one moment, please. I would also like to thank this year's cohort of Equity and Inclusion Fellows. The Equity and Inclusion Fellows aim to transform the practice of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging by combining insights from education with those from leadership and organizational development. The Fellows have been taught and supported by Human Huroni, an HGSC lecturer on education. This year, the Equity and Inclusion Fellows work to advance the mission and the, and the diversity initiatives in high-impact institutions in Boston and within HGSC in the larger Harvard community. The fellows collaborated with DEI offices in Boston City Hall, the Department of Education and Secondary Education, excuse me, Elementary and Secondary Education, Cambridge Public Schools, Somerville Public Schools, MIT, Brigham and Women's Hospital, among others. In addition, they developed and participated in programming throughout the academic year across HGSC and other schools at Harvard. I want to recognize the training and advice they have provided on key equity and inclusion issues facing these institutions. You have done tremendous work. I ask that the fellows and Human please stand so we can show our appreciation for your service. Thank you again. I would now like to take a moment to thank this year's Student Council. The Student Council is coordinated by Kevin Bohm, the Director of Student Affairs, and Andrea Lee, the Assistant Director for Community Building and International Student Support. Members are selected due to their leadership within program student advisory boards and represent each of the master's programs at the Ed School. 
This year's council made numerous contributions. They hosted community building and social events for students, including a successful HGSE formal. They helped to advance our goals for a cleaner environment through the facilitation of an Earth Day Charles River cleanup event. And they provided opportunities for students to share their feedback about their HGSE experience through a number of listening sessions. I now ask the members of the council to stand so we can show you our appreciation for your service. Thank you again. And now I'm going to turn the podium over to Marty West, the HGSE Academic Dean and Shattuck Professor of Education. Marty will introduce, introduce this afternoon's faculty speaker. Good afternoon. So <laughs> as Bridget said, it's now my pleasure to introduce our 2023 commencement faculty speaker, Tim McCarthy, an award. That usually happens when you say Tim's name. He's an award-winning scholar, educator, and activist who's taught at Harvard University for more than 20 years. So what is the commencement faculty speaker? Well, each year we ask the graduating class to select a faculty member who's made a significant impact on their HDSE experience to speak at convocation. It's always a competitive process, and Dean Long and I were thrilled to learn that Tim was chosen, that is, that you all chose Tim, to receive the honor this year. Dr. McCarthy is an historian of politics and social movements, and he teaches courses on equity in education, communication and leadership, and identity and social change. Here at HDSE, he's a core faculty member of the Equity and Opportunity Foundations team and our new online master's program in education leadership. Dr. McCarthy was previously at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, where he was the first openly gay faculty member and still teaches and still teaches the school's only course on LGBTQ plus matters. At Harvard, at Harvard Business School, he serves as faculty co-chair of the Communicating for Impact Executive Education program. As you can tell, Harvard schools have been forced to vie for Dr. McCarthy's time. And we're very proud that in 2021, he opted to make HGSE his primary professional home. The adopted only son and grandson of public school teachers and factory workers, Dr. McCarthy graduated with honors in history and literature from Harvard College and earned an MA, an MPhil, and a PhD in history from Columbia University. Inspired by the activism and organizing of his student years, Dr. McCarthy has devoted his career and indeed his life to public service and the pursuit of social justice. A few examples. As founding director of Harvard's Alternative Spring Break Church Rebuilding Program, he spent 15 years organizing hundreds of students to help rebuild black churches destroyed in racist arson attacks throughout the United States. He was a founding member of Barack Obama's National LGBT Leadership Council, gave, gave expert testimony to the Pentagon Comprehensive Working Group on the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and was part of the first ever LGBTQ delegation from the United States to Palestine in Israel. Twice, Dr. McCarthy was named one of the Harvard Crimson's Professors of the Year, and he has received many award, awards for his commitment to students around the university. He's a four-time winner of the Thomas Temp Kemple Hoops uh, Prize for Outstanding Senior Thesis Advising. He received the Kennedy School's highest teaching honor in 2019. And just yesterday, he was honored with the Evelyn Hammonds Award for exceptional service to Harvard's LGBTQ plus community. Let me give you a flavor of the numerous nominations we received for Dr. McCarthy when asking students who should be this year's faculty speaker. One student wrote, Professor McCarthy is the most supportive teacher I've encountered during my time at HDSE. He is there 110% of the time for the sole purpose of seeing us students prosper. He knows his craft 
and is amazing at helping others reach their potential. I have found his mentorship to be invaluable. There's one last reason I'm glad to be introducing Dr. McCarthy, and that's because it means I won't have to follow him. <laughs> and so, that's you, Dr. Simmons, I'm sorry. And so please join me in welcoming Professor Tim McCarthy. Thank you, Tim. I'm just a JV squad getting ready for President Ruth Simmons. I want to talk directly to the students. I see you. No, no, no. I know what you did here. You've spent the semester getting critical feedback from me on your speeches in real talk. And now you choose me to be your speaker at your graduation. When June Lay spoke last year, I was sitting right there and thinking, wow, what a great honor. This feels like a setup, y'all. <laughs> what I most love about days like this is meeting the people that you love. We all bring people into places like this, the teachers who inspired us to follow in their footsteps, the friends and family given and chosen who nurtured our journeys, and the elders and ancestors whose shoulders lift us up. Some of my people are here today, four generations, from my folks, Coach Mack and Michelle, passionate public school educators for a combined 79 years. To my niece, Malia, a brilliant scholar athlete who just turned 14 last week. In addition to being a grateful son and a glowing uncle, I am also a grandma's boy. In 1971, the year that I was born and adopted, my grandma McCarthy retired after 41 years of teaching. That fall, her district honored her by renaming the street to the new high school McCarthy Way. Grandma McCarthy had an old wooden swing in her backyard. It had two wide benches that faced each other. On the weekends, whenever the weather was nice, she would make a big pitcher of Lipton iced tea, and we would take our positions facing each other on that swing. She used to ask a lot of questions, millions of questions, but two stand out. What did you learn this week? And what do you have questions about? And I realize now in retrospect that she was trying to get me to talk about what I was being taught and to think critically about those things. She was always interested in what I was learning and what I was asking and in what I was saying. Every child deserves an adult in their life like that, a teacher who still wants to learn. That swing. That swing was my favorite school. Graham Bobernitz was also hungry to learn. Unlike Grandma McCarthy, who was a first-generation college student, Graham left high school when she was 16 to work in a garment factory in upstate New York. She was a cuffer, which meant that she put the cuffs on men's dress shirts, like the one I'm wearing today. Like her three Italian sisters, Graham could cook. And when I wasn't on that swing, I was in her kitchen smelling the sauce, marveling at the meatballs, 
hovering over the homemade pasta that seemed to stretch across every surface of that house. When I was in middle school and she was in about 60, Graham decided that she wanted to go back to school. This meant that she had to clear some space to study amidst all that macaroni. Sometimes we studied together. I would help her on her spelling, and she would help me on my math, and she beat me to high school graduation. When Graham passed on, in 2012, I buried my PhD diploma with her so that she could show it to all my other grandparents when she finally joined the afterlife party. My grandmother's cherished education for very different reasons. Grandma McCarthy, because she was among the first in our family to go to college, and Grandma Barbernitz because she went back to high school to finish what she started. I stand here today because those phenomenal women taught their only grandson to work hard and to dream big and to never, ever, ever take any of this for granted. And if you come to my office in Gutman Library, you will see the McCarthy Way sign and that GED where my PhD would be. My grandmothers were great at raising educators. I remember the day that I returned home from a summer in Ireland after my second year of graduate school. On the table in our living room, there were earmarked copies of W.E.B. Du Bois's Souls of Black Folk and Toni Morrison's Beloved. You see, my parents were reading those books so that they could better talk with me about the things that I was studying. And this shouldn't have surprised me. After all, my father started his teaching career in the mid-60s, co-teaching the first black history class at George Washington Carver Middle School in Albany, New York. And my mother, often on her own dime, would stack the shelves of her classroom library in her rural elementary school in upstate New York with diverse books that would probably be banned in a lot of states in this nation today. My parents, too, have always been open to learning new things, a practice that helped save their only son's life when he said, I'm gay, to them for the first time. I come from a legacy of lifelong learners, teachers who lead with curiosity and generosity and empathy and love. Raised by the role models that I was raised by, it's no surprise that I too have become a teacher who loves to learn. And I've learned so much from you. In our classroom communities and way outside of them, we have done good work together and we should feel proud of the fruits of our shared labor. But these last few years have been quite the crucible. Racial reckoning, treasonous insurrection, global pandemic. These are just three of the many challenges that we face, any one of which could be our undoing. These are not the best of times. And I know many of you feel stressed out and checked out and burned out, standing as you are precariously on the precipice of an unpromised future. But in the midst of this madness, we are bearing witness to brave awakenings the stirrings of kind and kindred souls that beckon a more beloved world. These are, there are precedents for this throughout history. Crucibles like slavery and segregation, apartheid and genocide have been unlikely crucible, have been unlikely incubators for some of the greatest revolutions the world has ever known. The, Frederick, the abolitionist Frederick Douglass reminded us if there is no struggle, there can be no progress. And at the risk of sounding gauzy and grand and perhaps even a bit mad myself, I believe that these recent world historical disruptions have changed us for good.
I say that because I have learned this from you. Because you've shown me how to listen more deeply and speak more lovingly. You've encouraged me to live at the intersections and sit with discomfort. You have engaged with real talk, in real talk with me when the classroom isn't yet safe enough for you to be brave. You've challenged me to make our classrooms more accessible and inclusive. You've checked me when my walk and my talk are misaligned. You've helped me to see that self-care is indeed revolutionary and that rest can be resistance too. You've reminded me that equity and justice must be actions, not just aspirations. And you've convinced me that your widespread impatience with the status quo you've inherited is not some sort of woke intolerance, but rather a powerful antidote to our persistent pathologies of racism and ableism, of misogyny and xenophobia, of homophobia, of biphobia, and of transphobia. People often ask me about you. Some of the questions are sweetly curious. What's it like to teach Harvard students? <laughs> Others are more blunt and crude. Are they really all entitled snowflakes? <laughs> the first kind of question prompts a proud papa bear response. They're fabulous. <laughs> the latter turns me quickly into a cranky old queen. <laughs> Sometimes I like being a cranky old queen. <laughs> but not today. There are a lot of misperceptions out there about places like this and people like us. Some are willful in their ignorance, others less so. The challenges before us right now is to prove to the world that we are part of the solution, not the root of the problem. And this shouldn't be hard for you. The things I have learned from you have changed me. You've made me a better professor and a better person. You have much to teach this world. And as you set out to do that, commit yourselves to being lifelong learners, people who lead with curiosity and generosity and empathy and love. After all, brave awakenings must be ongoing. Let us not be so awakened that we are lured into the lie that we have nothing left to learn. We have our work cut out for us because we are living in an age of bullies. Some of these bullies ban books and hate history. Some of these bullies cancel drag queens and won't say gay. Some of these bullies control where we go to the bathroom and what sports we can play. Some of these bullies revoke our rights to control our bodies. Some of these bullies push us out of school and into prisons. Some of these bullies build walls so they can send them back. Some of these bullies put kids in cages and separate migrant families. And some of these bullies are running for office and some of the worst of them win. Some of these bullies want to be president, including the one who was already twice impeached, who wants to be president again. Some of these bullies want to vanquish your vote and destroy our democracy. And more and more, they are armed with weapons of war. There are many kinds of bullies, 
But the one thing they all have in common is that they are broke and afraid. These are hurt people who hurt people because they refuse to make peace with their own pain. So they go to war, and the schools have become their battlegrounds. As educators, we teach and we learn. We're lovers in that regard. But we must also become fighters for truth, for justice, for our future. We did not pick these fights. They picked us. But fight them we must, and we will win. Because we must win. We can beat the bullies yet again by standing up to them with love. And I'm talking about love in the way that James Baldwin understood it. Quote, Love does not begin and end the way we seem to think it does. Love is battle. Love is war. Love is growing up. As I was preparing this speech, I got to thinking about the word bully. A few weeks ago, I posted a question on Facebook. What is the opposite of bully? I do this sometimes when I'm preparing speeches. <laughs> Crowdsourcing, you know, it's better than chat GPT. <laughs> the responses were fascinating. People came up with many antonyms for the verb to bully, but precious few for the noun the bully and then it dawned on me you are the antidote to the bullies you are the ones we've been waiting for you are the future we need when i look out at this diverse crowd of curious and generous and empathetic and loving teachers lifelong learners, my heart swells with hope. Because this future, the future that we could all share together, is brilliant and beautiful and brave. But enough of this talk. Hugsy class of 2023. Go change the world. Thank you again, Tim. I've got to put this down, a little taller than me. Uh, and congratulations again for being chosen by our students. I would now like to introduce our second student speaker, Cole Wilson. <laughs> Cole was chosen by our selection committee of faculty, staff, and students to be our second student speaker this year. For the past year, Cole has served, on, in, has served on the Education Policy Analysis Student Council, the HGSC Student Council, and as one of HGSC's Harvard Graduate Council representatives. When not in class, he works with the Harvard Educational Portal on their public school partnership initiatives and serves as a research assistant at, the, at Harvard's Project on Workforce. Before coming to Harvard, Cole spent the last two and a half years working to increase civic engagement across the state of Texas at the Annette Strauss Institute for Civic Life at the University of Texas. Cole has fought for young people's rights to affordable health care and higher education with young invincibles and served as a legislative director in Texas's 86th legislature. 
In other roles, Cole has worked on political campaigns across the nation, helped secure free four-year college for at-risk youth in New York, and worked on a lobby team representing clients such as Texas Teaching Hospitals and Texas Southmost College. After graduation, Cole plans to continue his work in the worlds of post-secondary and workforce access with the intent to return to his home state to give back to the community he calls home. Please join me in welcoming Cole. Thank you, Dean Long, for that introduction. And thank you to your entire team, all of the staff, the faculty, the folks that unlock our doors in the morning, the folks that lock up at night, everyone who has made Hugsy, Hugsy, that made this experience so incredible. I think I speak on behalf of our entire cohort in saying thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> While I have the mic, uh, Mom, Dad, Landry, Olivia, Papa, Rachel, Thank you for your support, your faith, your kindness, your love. Thank you for your love. I got here because of you, and I can't say it enough. Thank you so much. Okay. I I'm honored and so extremely privileged to have this opportunity to speak to such an amazing cohort of friends and colleagues and classmates. I thought it would be natural to start by reflecting on the sunny summer days we shared nine months ago on Appian Way, uh, sunny afternoons where questions vexed us like, where am I? Oh, what time zone am I in? Uh, how do I work this printer? <laughs> All right? And do I belong here? Those warm afternoons gave way to cool, crisp autumn evenings where the trees burst into brilliant reds and yellows, where we found ourselves huddled around busy tables in Gutman crammed in the dimly lit bars along Mass Avenue and seated at new tables with friends and colleagues and classmates sharing foreign foods and smiles. Gradually, we learned the answers to those initial questions. Uh, hopefully, we all figured out that printer. But some still lingered. Like, do I belong here? I'm a community college grad who paid his tuition with Pale Grants. I'm a dyslexic learner whose Harvard application was so riddled with misspellings, it was the butt of jokes amongst friends. I come from a family tree made up of dirt fields and oil rigs, a patchwork of teachers, lawyers, farmers, pipe fitters, and roughnecks paved the way for me to get to this stage, to this podium, to speak their story through this microphone. Do I belong here? There was a moment of clarity where the answer to this question came into focus for me. I was sitting at a long wooden table somewhere in rural Vermont. Uh, <laughs> it, it was my first time ever being in Vermont, much less in this tucked away uh, wooded hillside. I remember it was late autumn, the trees were bare, I hadn't seen the first snowflake yet. Uh, I see about a dozen of us had, had packed into cars and got up to this wonderful little winter oasis. Uh, we were sitting at this table with our computers open, clicking away at our homework, at our coursework, at our jobs. And I don't remember who said it, but I guess it doesn't really matter. They said, they said, I have no idea what I'm doing here. And none of us did, right? But the smiles and the laughs that bookended that sense of confusion meant something. That despite that confusion, that's, that disorientation, that unwillingness to embrace the unknown, I had a home here at Hugsy. And maybe, just maybe, I belonged where I was. Do our family names belong amongst the Kennedys, Roosevelts, Obamas, and Bloombergs? Before we came to Harvard, many of us lived lives defined by warm dinners and family jokes, inside laughter that seeks in the side streets when the joy becomes two rockets to be kept indoors. Stiff drinks and somber moments amongst cousins and siblings were the fabric of life itself, and those moments seem so foreign to the hollowed halls and red brick walls of Harvard, don't they? Yet we brought them here with us. We brought light into these halls. We made them our own. Our very presence on this green lawn under this tent mandates the truth. We belong here. Green Ivy is a new site to so many of us. 
It's a strange and unwieldy plant that seems to hide a history so ghastly, so distressing, that if we looked hard enough, we may not want to belong here. Yet we have earned the righteous and powerful opportunity to write new words onto the pages of Harvard's history, to breathe new life into the forgotten corners and hidden folds of this institution. Never to forget the past, but to honor it, to breathe new life into those lives lived. Our belonging here is a testament to those lives lived. Lest we not forget the trailblazers that opened doors, cracked codes, and laid roads for us, many of which did not look or sound like me, many of which fought for this seat so that our fight might be that much lighter, many of which would beam at our being here, at the sight of our triumph, of our belonging. Tomorrow will bring new fights, new bridges to cross, and will return the question of belonging. Will we belong in the office, at the organization, or on the team where we land? Will our names fit neatly into our coworkers' mouths? Will our needs be met with the compassion that they deserve? Will our kindness be reciprocated in full? There will be voices, forces, and systems that try their best to convince you otherwise. If you listen to them closely, I bet you can hear them right now. Let us not tune them out. No, defy them with your inevitable success, bravery, wisdom, and kindness. Will we belong there? Yeah, we will. When that moment comes, I want you to think back to here, think back to now, think back to the echo of your classmates' voices. At the end of the speech, there's a little call and response, okay? So y'all have a line, and I'm going to ask this question one more time. Your line is, hell yes. <laughs> Do we belong here? Thank you. So thank you again, Cole, and congratulations. And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the chair of the Alumni Council, Russell Willis, who will present the 2023 Alumni Awards. Russell earned two master's degrees from HTSC, one in 1996 and a second in 2002. He has held leadership positions at a variety of educational settings, from independent schools to public schools, including charters and universities. He is currently the executive director for the University of North Georgia's Oconee campus. Russell is also a trained diversity, equity, and inclusion practitioner and has presented nationwide on topics ranging from student, color, student of color achievement and motivation to adapt, adaptation and affinity groups. I want to thank Russell and the rest of the Alumni Council for their hard work this year and their continued dedication to HGSE's mission. Please join me in welcoming Russell. Wow, what an introduction. Thank you, Dean Long. I wish Mama was here to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Class of 2023, welcome to the HGSC alumni community. That deserves an applause. <laughs> Dr. Chosa, will you please stand? <laughs> the 2023 HGSC Alumni Council Award for Excellence in Education goes to an incredible advocate and leader in the field of indigenous education. Dr. Carnell Chosa, who received his EDM here uh, in 1996. Dr. Chosa is a Jemez Pueblo tribal member and deeply respected educator in New Mexico who has dedicated his life to improving the lives of indigenous peoples through education and self-determination. For over 25 years, Dr. Chosa has served as the co-founder and co-director of the Leadership Institute, 
whose mission is to provide sustainable opportunities for the appreciation of the uniqueness of indigenous cultures, to provide meaningful and solution-oriented engagement in intellectual discourse regarding critical indigenous issues, and to transform the impact of externally developed policy on tribal community institutions by cultivating emerging intergenerational indigenous leaders. For four years ago, Dr. Chosa founded the Attach Your Heart Foundation, providing scholarships and forms of financial assistance to Pueblo Indian students pursuing higher education. Dr. Chosa continues to see the ripple effect of his work through the alumni who have become change makers and returned to the community. His work has made an impact on generations of over 22 tribes. He is most deserving of this award. For these and other profound and future contributions to education, it is with great respect to bestow the 2023 HGSC Alumni Council Award for Excellence in Education upon Dr. Carnell Chosa. Dr. Thomas, will you please stand? This year, the HGSC Alumni Council has introduced a new award. The HGSC Alumni Council Award for Impact in Education, recognizing the work of an alum who successfully created and or implemented work that has dem demonstrably impacted the field of education. Our inaugural recipient of this award is Dr. Nancy Thomas, who received her EDD degree here in 1996. With this award, we are recognizing Dr. Thomas's tremendous impact on education for democracy. At a challenging time for democracy, both here in the United States and globally, Dr. Thomas has served as the director of the Institute for Democracy in Higher Education in the Jonathan M. Tisch College of Civic Life at Tufts University since 2012. During this time, she created the National Study of Learning, Voting, and Engagement. Through the National Study of Learning, Voting, and Engagement, Dr. Thomas has developed the nation's only objective measure of student civic engagement. In just six years, the number of participating campuses has grown to over 1,200, with a data set of 10 million plus students per year. That's impact. <laughs> Dr. Thomas has been widely published and received grants on dialogue, academic freedom, free speech, and deliberative democracy. And I cannot think of a more important time in the history of this country that we need her work. It is with great honor that for these accomplishments and more to come, <laughs> we recognize Dr. Nancy Thomas with the 2023 HGSC Alumni Council Award for Impact in Education. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it is now my pleasure to welcome the 2023 convocation speaker, Dr. Ruth Simmons. Dr. Simmons' incomparable career in academia is marked by her belief in the transformative power of education. 
a native of Grapeland, Texas, and the 12th child of a Texas sharecropper and a domestic worker, Dr. Simmons began her career in academia with a scholarship to Dillard University in 1967, where she graduated summa cum laude. It's going to, it's going to be, no, no. <laughs> Let's see, what can, what can I cut? What can I cut? Wait, okay, no, I do, I do need to do this part. Okay. When she was at Princeton, she was the associate dean of faculty, and then she served as provost of Spelman College before returning to Princeton as vice provost, vice provost, and it was during this time that I first met Dr. Simmons as a wide-eyed undergraduate who was just beginning to see the world and understand what was possible. Dr. Simmons exemplifies the incredible things that are possible through education. Okay, just briefly, you taught me to be a strong woman, come on. In 1995, she became the ninth president of Smith College, the largest women's college in the United States. In 2001, she was appointed the 18th president of Brown University and became the first African-American to lead an Ivy League institution. Okay, she's not going to let me finish this, but I do want to say one quote that really jumped out at me. So in a 1999 article, the author describes how Dr. Simmons' love for school led her to academic life. I felt that anything could take a that could take a child and turn her into the person I was becoming must be the most powerful place on earth. So we are honored to have Dr. Ruth Simmons. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my God. Thank you. Thank you so much. But thank you. It has been so wonderful to be here today and to hear these magnificent speeches. I, I've begun to think, Dean Long, if I could have my Harvard degree rescinded and become a, what do you call it here? The, H Hug Hugsy. Hugsy graduate. Yes. Could we do that? Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah, no you want to come tomorrow? We can give you a doctor's? What a, <laughs> what a wonderful environment. And I just want to thank the speakers for uh, the magnificent way in which you characterize your lives and the possibilities for these students. Thank you so much. Now, I want to say to, of course, to Dean Long, to faculty and staff, uh, to all the guests, good afternoon. Uh, for all of you who come today to mark this important moment in these graduates' lives, I begin on this auspicious occasion by thanking those who've given so much to assist the graduates in their aspirations and endeavors, and I know that's not always easy to do. Who are they? Faculty and staff, uh, family, friends, and mentors, detractors even, who sought to dissuade them from their pursuits and instead spurred them to dig deeper and persist in their goal. And most of all, the teachers who created the means for their intellect to blossom, their independence of mind to become rooted in knowledge, their courage to grow and be fortified and their sight line to be lifted far above what they thought possible. God bless teachers for doing that most essential and elevated of human endeavors, caring for the young. 
Now, I might tell you, I, I, I'm going to talk through applause. So, so maybe you wouldn't want to do that uh, because <laughs> you may be missing some gems. <laughs> now, finally, but no less importantly to today's uh, graduates who arrived at this point after years of growth and challenge, oh my goodness, congratulations. This day is about you and the beautiful music you will make in your careers, music that, you will that will nourish and inspire generations, generations of learners and strivers. I know um, in your youth, you can't anticipate this now, but I stand here as someone looking back over decades, and I can tell you that you will be gratified and surprised by the large number of people that you have inspired. Whether that music that you make is mellifluous or atonal from time to time, it will doubtless move many to enlightenment and discovery, propelling them through myriad challenges over the course of their lifetime. This day is for you educators, you educators, without whom fewer new discoveries would be made. It is for you educators who have the power to enlarge human understanding and make salient our common humanity. It is for you educators who offer a path to those who cannot see beyond the mountain of impediments obstructing their view to the horizon. Yes, on this day, we raise a song to you for your belief in what is possible with learning. Our thanks to each of you for committing yourselves to empowering others to improve the world. Now, as I prepared for today's ceremony, I couldn't help but worry, frankly, about what I might say to send you on your way with a determined hopefulness about the future. I thought about recent events here and around the world that raise pressing questions about how we can advance. It is not, I think, overstating the challenges of this environment that educators face today by saying that more and more extraordinarily burdensome worries cast a pall over our formal learning environments. These worries are such that they might cause students to question their prospects for a useful and fulfilling life. What new tragedy, they must ask, will arise tomorrow to unsettle further their future? What old hatreds will reemerge, slamming door shut doors that heretofore stood ajar? More and more often, it seems such doubts are the ever-present companions for students from the time they start school until they graduate from college. Think of it. A student graduating today with an undergraduate degree will have begun school at the time of the mass shooting at Virginia Tech that killed 32 people. Think back over that period of time and what has happened. And of course, in that same year, the iPhone debuted, Harry Potter series began, and the Great Recession loomed. They and every generation of learners since have grown up and studied through a dizzying array of events that call into question whether modern society will ever afford the ever hoped for steady upward trajectory of progress. Fortunately, you will be called on to provide that hope to those who face ever-present doubts as they attempt to focus on doing their best. Yeah, maybe there was a time when educators like you chose their path because of the certainty that it offered. While they perhaps knew there might be ruts along the way, they thought they could be managed. But the frequency of destabilizing events today has added a new dimension to the consideration of a career in education, whether teacher, administrator, researcher, policymaker, or leader, educators are now frontline workers 
with the task of not merely providing a service, but the duty to bring to the world a vision of what is possible even when signposts read, danger ahead, do not proceed. I must confess, um, you might not believe this looking at me, but, but I use a GPS. <laughs> and I do. Um, but I'm always startled and, and troubled, really, when the voice from this application says ominously, caution, danger ahead. It throws me every time. The warning sends me into a state of high apprehension. I immediately begin to worry about what I will face ahead. Uh, should I exit the road and look for an alternative route? Should I just slow down to a creep? How will I react if there's a serious accident ahead and there are injuries? Will that picture be in my mind for the rest of the day? And of course, most frequently, I proceed with caution only to discover that the ominous voice has overstated the danger. But nevertheless, the warning has had an effect on me. Warnings do that. Signs do that to us. Such is the difficulty of these times when ominous warnings and real catastrophic events are ubiquitous, causing us to be wary of the path ahead. As amateur futurists and inevitable purveyors of hope to those beset by this reality, how are you going to ensure that you do not lose your vision and hopefulness at a moment when education itself is under assault? Of course, effective responses to challenges is the lifeblood of societal advancement and the product of a strong education. As educators, we welcome new tools of learning and shortcuts to research and discovery in the interest of efficient problem solving. The advent of computing and other technologically advanced devices that speed time to and enlarge the capacity of problem solving has not only facilitated many life-saving and life-sustaining efforts, but it has also made possible ready access to information that would previously have been inaccessible. There is no question that the learning environment is richer for the students and teachers able to take advantage of these tools. Yet, we have not yet discovered the means to accommodate the need for greater cultural understanding in spite of the fact that much information is now available to us in ways that should assist us in being more aware of the complexity of the world and the variety of people inhabiting it. While in previous times we believed that narrowness of mind was a condition of not having access to information, we now can see that the narrow vision that afflicts us is often a willful condition enabled by self-applied blinders. And so in spite of the growing number of aids to education, we have, it seems, a growing number of impediments to full enlightenment. What does the educators face in this new environment? At a moment when we should be the most informed, poisonous, invective-laden, and unsubstantiated assertions are hurled across political divides and into our schools and colleges. So-called false facts have come to replace conclusions supported by rigorous analysis and are deployed often casually as a means of navigating difficult issues and forestalling undesired outcomes. As much as we assert the need for careful and objective analysis to inform our decisions and actions, some take the opposite course, inflaming others to believe that irrational analysis and the creation of unsubstantiated evidence is a legitimate course when advancing narrow interests. Uninformed armchair theorists and activists aim their ire and their strategy at overturning the shape and content of education at every level. 
these interlopers who lack the knowledge and expertise to shape any educational content would lay siege to the profession that since Horace Mann has built brick by brick the wherewithal for the world to advance in unimagined ways, creating myriad paths to astounding discoveries that save lives and habitats and advance the overall well-being of societies. I was born at a time of darkness and limitations. Unknowing demagogues ordered that every person of my ilk should be relegated to limited education and achievement. Enlightened individuals resisted the calls for permanent enslavement of our minds and aspirations. And with the help of educators, I was able to have access not only to learning, not only to learning, but to hope in the future. Like the Graduate School of Education at Harvard, these educators sought to promote success of all learners by putting powerful ideas into practice. And because they fought the pernicious ideas that would have dampened innovation and consigned generations to, mere, to be mere observers of the march of progress, we all won with a stronger nation and the inclusion of previously barred groups from the constitutional rights afforded citizens. So as those committed to leveling the playing field, we find ourselves under attack for the basic tenet that led Horace Mann to call for universal education, that everyone should have access to learning that enables them to live better and more fulfilling lives. More and more public figures feel secure in advocating for an end to the ideal of equal access. The principle that providing for those least able to advocate for themselves makes us stronger as a nation has given way, it seems, to the thought that only certain elites should avail themselves of the best that we can provide. The contempt for an inhumane treatment of vulnerable populations has garnered a surprising degree of support, making it challenging to secure the funding needed to educate these populations. The attack upon education is a means to achieving fundamentally base aims. Those who are most expert in shaping the education of learners have become, it seems, bad actors inserting into curricula subjects that are inimical to some individual's political and tribal goals. Their way to upend the influence of educators is to call into question their qualifications to play such an important role. Parents, religious groups, and public officials, they argue, should have the strongest voice in shaping the education of young people. Now, while debate is healthy and the involvement of communities in the educational mix is welcome, undermining the most knowledgeable and expert educators in the task of building learning communities is misguided and unwise. Whatever the nature and source of the attacks or the instability we face, our young people must feel it even more acutely for they are less familiar with dystopian periods in our history. And so I'm given to reminding my students that we've been here before. Often they are incredulous when they, have, when they hear that, and so I have to tell them about growing up in the 40s and 50s in the Jim Crow South, growing up in the country at a time and in areas where evil reigned. I'm certain that I felt as many young people today feel, overwhelmed. Lynchings for being in the wrong place, assassinations for espousing freedom, public policy governed by racial hatred and segregation. Yes, I was overwhelmed at times by the magnitude of the ills I perceived as a young person, yet something happened to help me see beyond a pervasive fog of malevolence. Teachers, educators, I am amazed even today 
to recall how hopeful they seemed in the face of overwhelming circumstances. As a lifelong educator, I can understand now how their calling imbued in them a hopefulness that could not be stanched by signs of danger ahead. Those of us drawn to education invariably believe that by assuring people's ability to evolve through learning, we will always have a way out of madness, always. We believe that by enlightening others, we have an opportunity to shape a common understanding of our humanity. We know that by probing deeply into what is and can be known, we can withstand any assault, any on our humanity, any assault on our future. Many outside of our profession and also are also persuaded of the importance of education. One of our local heroes in Texas, Charles Butt, chairman of HEB, a Texas chain of grocery stores, was so driven by the conviction that how well we educate our children will define our future as a nation that through a magnanimous personal gift, he established a center for leadership in public education. His project, the Holdsworth Center, whose board I was pleased to chair for six years, has helped over 1,400 educators from 50 school districts build strong leadership. That is what it will take to weather the current environment. The support of educators, business people, volunteers, and others of equally good faith who agree that only courageous and able educators can continue to protect the ability of all children to have access to the education they deserve. Nobody should be on the sidelines in this struggle. Nobody, no matter what their profession. Now, here's what I really want to say to you today. You, more than anybody I can think of, have at your disposal the capacity to shape the future. By embracing education, you are clutching the lifeline to a sane and sensible future for our children. It may well be that we will endure periods of hostility to the notion of education or antipathy towards everything we value as educators, but time will demonstrate that educa educators play a pivotal role in what the world can be in the future. After all, the results speak for themselves. Learners have across centuries benefited from the courageous actions of theorists, inventors, philosophers, writers, artists, and others who have together formed a powerful redoubt against misguided individuals who sought to ban knowledge and limit the capacity of learners. Now, it is our turn, our turn to draw upon their example and resist efforts to create a new dark age that inculcates learners and society with self-serving false information. I hope you will take this oath of office when you leave, that you will do your best to exemplify and defend the bedrock values of education. Truth, open-mindedness, independence and rigor of thought, and a commitment to the advancement of society. If you accept these values, and more importantly, if you live up to them, you will forever be hopeful, forever strong in your views of what matters, and forever, forever able to heal this nation. Yours, yours is a calling above all others above all others. Thank you for embracing this magnificent profession.
I told her it was the right color there. So thank you again, Dr. Simmons, for all that you've done and that you continue to do. And you're going to hate me saying this, but thank you personally for being such an inspiration to me. I hope that I'm passing that on to others. All right. So we're just about done. Uh, just a few closing announcements. Uh, first, I want to thank the many, many people who have made this event possible and all the events at commencement. Thank you so much, all of the faculty, the staff, who have volunteered to give their time to be here. Please join me, though, especially in thanking the team from the Office of Student Affairs, Kevin Bohm, Alex Galindo, Andrea Lee, Kellyanne Robinson, and Crystal Quintanilla. And special thanks to our operations team, especially Amy Fenton and the team from the Registrar's Office, Degree Programs, IT, Marketing and Communications. So, thank you, thank you, thank you. And now just a few reminders. So to all of our students, please be sure to be ready on Appian Way promptly at what time? 7.20. Oh, that's great. 7.20. I know we're not going to have any problems with that, but do remember to bring your Harvard IDs as you will need them during the day. Now, when we get to Harvard Yard, there will come a part where I will stand and present you to President Bacow to confer your degrees. And how are you going to respond? <laughs> Didn't hear very much from over here. I got to tell you, HGSC is known for being the loudest school, and so we have to keep that tradition going. Finally, I'd like to extend an invitation to all the graduates, as well as their family and friends, to attend the block party that's going to be an Appian Way that's going to start in just a few minutes. The rain is holding off, so we're still outside. Uh, and again, I hope you uh, get a chance to hear the first annual I'm hoping first annual that will continue HGSC faculty and staff band. So thank you all and enjoy the party. See you tomorrow. bothers me.